Good afternoon. Um, I'm Chris Sims. I'm co-director along with uh, Professor Ilyana Kuzienko of the Griswold Center for Economic Policy Studies. <clears throat> Our talk today is co-sponsored by the Griswold Center and the Jewish Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. Um, our speaker today is William Dudley. Um, we're honored to have him as a senior research scholar at the Griswold Center uh, uh, at the current time. Um, he served as president and chief executive officer of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York at an interesting time, 2009 to 2018, and as vice chairman of the Federal Open Market Committee. Uh, previously, he served as executive vice president of the markets group at the New York Fed, where he also managed the system open market account for the FOMC. Prior to joining the bank in 2007, Bill was a partner and managing director at Goldman Sachs and was the firm's chief U.S. economist for a decade. Um, he's going to speak. Uh, for an hour or so. When he's done, there will be time for Q&A. Since the audience is big and there's also people working on closed cir circuit in another room, um, we're going to do the Q&A with uh, written questions. And there should be cards on your seats. So if you can write, if you have a question, write them out. We'll at the end of the talk, we'll collect them and answer questions from the cards. So Bill, would you start? Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at Princeton. I'm, I feel like I'm making progress in my career. I applied to Princeton as an undergrad, and I got waitlisted. Uh, then I applied to graduate school, and it was too expensive. Uh, and then finally, I got to come here and teach. <laughs> so I'm making, I'm making progress. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to pose a question today that I think is on everybody's minds. Uh, we have the longest economic expansion in US history, and so people, that, that, that makes you a little nervous. Uh, my mom is 96 years old, <laughs> so you can see why that's very much on my mind. And so the question is, can it keep going or not? Um, the very short answer is yes, it can. Uh, we're having a long expansion right now for three fundamental reasons. Uh, number one, there is a trend to just longer economic expansions. If you lo look at the expansions in the 50s, that we had three or four recessions. Uh, if you look at the last three expansions, 82 to 90, 91 to 1,000 to 2,000 and 2001 to 2008. Those are were, those were actually longer than average. And the reason why we're tending towards longer economic expansions is the economy is less cyclical because it's more of a service sector economy and a little bit less of a goods economy. And because we are now part of a global uh, economic system uh, so that uh, if demand here falters, we don't bear the full brunt of it. Some of that is born abroad in Europe and China and Japan and so on. So you can, you can think about a globalized economy as having as being more stable economy because there's always someone else that can maybe take up a little bit uh, of, this, of the slack. Also, we have uh, just-in-time inventory management now. So if you look back at the 50s and 60s, and 70s, most of the, of the downturn in the economy was caused by inventories piling up businesses being slow to realize it, and then when they realized it, they had to cut production a lot and lay off a lot of workers. Now they have much better information about what's going on in terms of their sales. And so when demand weakens, it gets transmitted back to production very, very quickly, and so the production adjustments can be smaller uh, than they've been in the past. Second reason for very long expansion is because we had a very deep recession. Uh, the deeper the recession, the higher the unemployment rate. That means there's more room to expand and grow. The unemployment rate after the last downturn was over 10%. It was the worst uh, economic downturn uh, since the Great Depression. And so we were very far away from full employment. Uh, and the expansion on top of that was very slow. I mean, if we'd come racing back, maybe we could have cut the gap in uh, excess capacity and labor in a few years, but we were growing pretty darn slowly. Uh, 
So there was plenty of time. Uh, Jan Yellen used to have the analogy of we're driving across the country, starting in the West Coast, because that's where Janet uh, used to hang out. And Janet used to always say, well, now we're sort of, we made it to like Chicago. And you got the sense that it was going to be a long time before the Fed actually achieved its mission of getting back to full employment. That's because we were starting from so far uh, way out. And the third reason why we're having a long expansion is we actually got pleasantly surprised by how low we could push the unemployment rate without having an inflation problem. If you'd asked people at the Fed a few years ago, what's full employment? In other words, what's the level of unemployment that you can go to without having an inflation problem? They probably would have picked something in the range of 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 unemployment rate. Well, today we have an unemployment rate of 3.5% and we still have no inflation. So there, it turns out that there was more room to grow uh, than we thought. So thinking about the outlook, I think that the outlook for a sustained expansion is still uh, quite good for a couple reasons. First of all, financial conditions are very accommodative. Look at the stock market, look at the level of bond yields, look at the level of credit spreads. Uh, the, the financial sector is, 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 is doing fine. Second of all, if you look at the household sector, which is the biggest chunk of the economy, about two-thirds of spending in the U.S. economy is coming out of the household sector, they're in a very different uh, situation today than they were at the beginning of the last economic downturn. Uh, they have some very solid job, job growth. Uh, wages are rising more rapidly, so the income trend is very solid. And on top of that, they haven't taken on much debt in this cycle, unlike what happened after the housing boom. Uh, the, house, the housing market is actually having a bit of a recovery right now. Uh, the last few months, housing has actually responded quite uh, sharply to the decline in long-term mortgage rates. And so that's just another reason. It would be very odd to have a cyclical recovery in housing at a time that the U.S. economy was going into recession. If you look at the weakness of the economy, it's really focused in two areas, investment spending and manufacturing, and obviously investment spending and manufacturing are closely related. We can tie this very much back to the uncertainty that we have about U.S. trade policy, uh, and we can also tie that back to the fact that that uncertainty about trade around the world is contributing to weak global growth that has implications for demand for our goods and services. Now, when I take apart uh, the risk to the outlook, I think that by far the biggest uncertainty is what's going to happen in terms of U.S. trade. Uh, U.S. trade uncertainty uh, hurts uh, the economy because it basically causes businesses to hold back on new investment. Where should I locate that new investment? Should I locate it in China? Should I locate it in Mexico? Should I locate it in Vietnam? Or should I locate it in the U.S.? I don't really know because I don't know what the rules of the game are going to be on trade, and so that causes me to hold off. In addition to the uncertainty that's affecting investment, we also have a question of how high are tariffs going to go. Uh, so far, the Trump administration has put tariffs on roughly about a half of uh, all Chinese imports, but they've threatened to raise the level of tariffs and expand them to all the remaining Chinese imports over the next couple months. And if you have 25% tariffs on all Chinese imports into the U.S., we're now talking about real money uh, because Chinese imports in the U.S. are over $600 billion a year. 25% of that, it's $150 billion tax on households and businesses. The December tariff round is the most uh, important one because that's where the, the Trump administration is threatening to put the tariffs on consumer goods. Those consumer goods cannot be relocated very easily. Think about Apple uh, producing literally tens of millions of iPhones in China. If they wanted to move that someplace else, it would take them years to do that. Now, I am highly uncertain about what's going to happen in terms of U.S. trade policy. Probably President Trump is highly uncertain about what's going to happen in <laughs> U.S. trade policies. On one hand, he clearly has uh, strong incentives to make a deal because if this is the one, number one risk to the U.S. economic outlook, and if the U.S. economic outlook, is, besides the impeachment proceedings, is the number one risk uh, to him being reelected, he should very much want to take the trade uncertainty off the table so he can actually have a healthy economy. But it is, at the same time, it's harder to see how that's going to happen now because – 
I think what's changed is that both sides have gotten dug in, the Chinese and the US. And the Chinese now uh, see that maybe the president's not going to be the president uh, beyond uh, the end of 2020. So I think that the Chinese really have, their incentives have actually changed more in the direction of, of, of driving a harder bargain. And so that's going to make it hard for uh, the president to get a deal that he can claim is a great deal, a perfect deal, uh, that, he can, uh, that, 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 that he can take, uh, take, take out uh, politically. So I don't know what's going to happen there, but I certainly feel like the incentives are to reach some sort of uh, accommodation. But I thought that six months ago, and we haven't gotten to that place. So if the outlook for the economy is pretty good, X the trade uncertainty, so what is it that actually ends expansions? Because that obviously is going to color our view about how likely a recession is. Well, it turns out expansions don't die of old age. They don't die just because they're old. They typically are killed off by one of two things. The US Federal Reserve tightening monetary policy because there's an inflation problem, or because there's some big shock to the economy that that, that jolts the economy faster than the Fed and Congress and the administration can respond to to support the economy. So think about 9-11. Uh, uh, think about uh, the oil price shock in, this, in the, the two oil price shocks we had in the 1970s. There are things that sometimes just come along uh, that are really negative for the economy uh, that people can't respond to fast enough to actually print, print a recession. So we don't have an inflation problem right now. So you wouldn't really think that the Fed is going to try to you know, tighten monetary policy to, 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 to end this economic expansion. And so the real question is, is the trade policy uncertainty going to be uh, a, a significant enough shock? Now, some people are worried about the risk of recession because they see a very flat yield curve. So the yield curve is the shape of Treasury yields as you go from three months Treasury bills to 10-year Treasury notes to 30-year Treasury bonds. And right now, the yield curve is very, very flat. There's virtually no difference in yield, depending what, regardless of the maturity of the Treasury in instruments that you invest in. And this has people pretty nervous, because in the past, whenever the yield curve has gotten very flat, or especially when it's inverted, that's been a very reliable signal that the economy is going to go into recession. So people are saying, well, the yield curve is really flat. It's not you know, quite really inverted yet, but it's very, very flat. And so people are saying, gee, this means that we might have a recession. The New York Fed has a model that's just based on the shape of the yield curve as a predictor of recession. And right now, this current month, they have a 35% of 35% chance of recession in the next 12 months, uh, just based on the shape of the yield curve. Well, I hate to say this time is different. When economists say that, they usually get in a great deal of difficulty. I do think that applies to the yield curve. Because I don't think the yield curve is flat because monetary policy is tight. I think the yield curve is flat because people are worried about recession, and they want to own long-term treasury bonds. So if the economy hits a recession, they at least have one asset that performs well. Uh, the bond market has changed pretty uh, importantly over the last you know, 10 or 15 years. It used to be that. You, you, you were worried about bonds uh, being threatened by inflation, and so growth and bonds were sort of bad, or, or sort of a bad mix. And uh, whenever there was a sign of inflation ticking up, the bond market would perform very badly, and typically bond yields went up as you got later and later in the economic expansion. In the current environment, it's very different. Uh, people actually want to own bonds because they're actually worried about recession. They're not worried about inflation. And so if you look at what economists call the bond term premium, so the bond term premium is a technical term, but all it means is you tell me what expected short-term rates are going to be over the next 30 years, and I compare that expectation of short-term rates over the next 30 years, and I compare that to the 30-year Treasury yield, that difference is the bond term premium. And right now, the bond term premium are basically zero. Uh, people basically think that short-term rates over the next 20, 30 years are about the same level as what you see 30-year Treasury bond yields yielding today. That's a very, very unusual. Historically, the spread between 10-year Treasury notes and three-month Treasury bills was 100 basis points. Now, it moved around depending on where you were on the economic cycle, but on average, it was 100 basis points. And that's really what gave the yield curve its power because when it inverted, 
it meant that monetary policy typically was tight because it took a tight monetary policy to actually cause the yield curve to get inverted. This time we don't have that. Monetary policy is clearly not tight. We can see that by the recovery that we're actually seeing in the housing sector. So the yield curve signal is not giving the signal that it normally gives because it's flat for a totally different reason. Another thing that's gotten people concerned about uh, a recession is that we've actually had a little bit of turbulence in U.S. money markets. So three and a half weeks ago, uh, the, the corporate tax state came due, September 15th, and there's also settlement of a treasury auction. And both those events caused a lot of money to move out of the private sector into the treasury's account at the Federal Reserve. That pushed down the amount of bank reserves in the system and generated upward pressure on money market rates. Now, the reason why that scared people is people remembered back to August 2007 when there was upward pressure on money market rates, which was the canary in the coal mine that basically foreshadowed uh, the great financial crisis. So I'm going to make the same argument I made before for the yield curve. This time is different. The reason why we saw this upward pressure on repo rates is because Reserves got to be a little bit scarce on that day relative to what banks demanded. Now, you might ask the question, why did the Fed let that happen? Well, the Fed, if you remember, grew its balance sheet enormously over the, over the last decade. So they added lots of bank reserves to the system. So the amount of reserves in the system was up here. The underlying demand for reserves was down here. And so there was no upward pressure on money market rates. The Fed starts to shrink its balance sheet, and the amount of reserves in the system comes down. The Fed doesn't really know what the demand for reserves is, is because it's never been there in the last decade. So eventually, reserve, demand for reserves and the supply for reserves becomes about equal. The Fed goes, oh, so that's where the underlying demand for reserves are. And so you start to see upward pressure on rates. The day you saw the upward pressure on rates, what do you think happened the next day? Did people want to hold more reserves, or did they want to hold less reserves? They wanted to hold more reserve because, look, they just saw this spike in, in short-term money market rates. And so that kept the process going. Very easy for the Fed to solve. If demand for reserves is roughly equal to the supply for reserves, and you're getting more volatility in money market rates, all you got to do is go out and buy some Treasury securities and increase the supply of reserves. And that's precisely what the Fed's going to do. They've done some open market operations, which are a very short-term fix to add reserves to the banking system. So they're basically lending against the securities collateral of securities firms, and that adds reserves to the system. But their longer-term fix is they're going to actually go out and buy treasury bills. And for every dollar treasury bill they buy, they're going to be adding reserves to the banking system. So this time is truly different. Now, in terms of monetary policy, uh, you know, I think that I, I think there's no question that monetary policy isn't tight. Just look at the level of the stock market, uh, the level of bond yields, the tightness of credit spreads. And the Fed is clearly in easing mode right now. And this is pretty unusual. I mean, if you had basically said that the economy was at full employment, or maybe even a little bit past full employment at 3.5 percent, inflation was close to the two percent to its two percent objective and the federal funds rate was one and three quarters to 2% and headed downward, people would think you were, were nuts. So the question is, why is the Fed doing what it's doing? The Fed's doing what it's doing because there's no inflation. And the Fed doesn't want to be in a situation where they're wrong about the economic outlook, there is a recession, and then people say to the Fed, you dummies. Why did you not ease monetary policy? Couldn't you see there was a risk of recession? The excuse that, well, we were worried that there might be an inflation problem sometime down the road would not have been a very credible uh, response. The Fed's view, I think, is very simple. If you think about it from a perspective of, of regret, the Fed doesn't really know for sure how the economy is going to evolve, but how are they going to feel best? Are they going to feel better if the economy is stronger than expected? and the insurance monetary policy easings turn out to be unnecessary, in that situation, the economy would be stronger than expected, and the economy and inflation will move back towards the Fed's 2% objective. That doesn't sound too bad. In contrast, if they don't ease monetary policy and the economy falls into recession, 
people will be saying, well, what did you do that for? Why, couldn't you see the economy was in, at risk, and why weren't you cutting short-term interest rates? So I think from the Fed's perspective, they're, they're being pretty smart. They're taking out insurance against a, a downside risk, and if they're wrong, the costs to them are very low of being wrong in the current environment. Now, people wonder, given the president's attacks on uh, Chairman Powell and, and the Federal Reserve, he's called them boneheads, he's called Chair Powell an enemy, um, is the Fed easing because of President Trump's attacks? Uh, I don't think so, because I, I think there really are good reasons for the Fed to be cutting uh, interest rates. But I th think the President's attacks on the Fed do create a question about whether the Fed is easing, in part, uh, because if you look at the Fed officials, it's mostly the Federal Reserve governors who are more on the easing side, and it's mostly the Federal Reserve Bank presidents who are mostly on the, no, I don't think we need to ease quite yet. And so that split makes you wonder if the, you know, being in Washington, you feel more pressure if you're, than if you're sitting in some other place. The last uh, summary of economic projections, every two quarter the Fed publishes a summary of economic projections where each FOMC participant writes down what they think interest rates are likely to do over the next couple of years. And the last summary of economic projection was pretty interesting. There were five people who thought the Fed shouldn't have even cut at the last meeting. So they had the funds rate at the end of the year at two to two and a quarter. And there were seven people who thought the funds rate should be cut one more time in addition to what they did at the last meeting. That's an unusually, uh, unusually wide uh, split uh, on the FOMC. I think the Fed very much tries to be apolitical, and I really admire Chair Powell trying to stay out, out above the fray. But I think when the president is attacking the Fed on a regular basis, uh, I think it's hard to be, remain completely apolitical because people are just going to wonder, is this affecting uh, what you're doing in terms of monetary policy? So what other things should you keep your eye on? So I've given you a pretty optimistic uh, assessment of the risk of recession with the wild card of, I have no idea what's going to happen on, on U.S. trade policy. There's one other cautionary note, and that's keep your eye on the unemployment rate. The U.S. economy seems to have a stall speed. So if the economy grows slow enough to cause the unemployment rate to rise a bit, the next thing is always recession. There's this very interesting imperial reg imperial empirical regularity that you can see throughout uh, U.S. economic history. Every time that the unemployment in the U.S. has risen by more than a third of a percentage point since World War II, the next stop has not been, oh, we have you know, just slow growth and the unemployment rate peaks you know, half percent higher than it was. No, the next stop is a recession and 1.9% minimum rise in the unemployment rate. There's literally no examples where the unemployment rate has risen just a half percent or where it's ri risen just 1% or where it's risen just 1.5%. So what that suggests, that empirical regularity, is that there's something going on once the unemployment rate starts rising uh, by a bit it must start to scare people in terms, you know, they hear that people are losing their jobs, and then that causes them to pull back, and that ca causes demand to weaken, that causes businesses to stop hiring, and the whole thing tends to feed on itself. So keep your eye on the unemployment rate, 3.5% right now. If it, you know, goes up to 3.6, 3.7, maybe even 3.8, we're probably okay. But if it climbs to 4, probably going to have a recession. Uh, because you will probably have actually hit the stall, stall, stall speed for the economy uh, going forward. So the bottom line for me is recession is not likely the base case. Keep your eye attentively on U.S. trade policy, especially watch whether the president actually puts into place the tariffs that he threatened against China and also against European car uh, imports. And if that happens, then the risks go up significantly. Uh, and if it doesn't, then the risks go down from where we are today. Now I'd be happy to open up for any questions.
Okay, so first question I have here is, do you think interest rates in the U.S. might ever enter negative territory? Well, ever is a very long time, so I'll say yes. <laughs> but I think that generally the appetite in the U.S. by the Federal Reserve to move to negative interest rates always has been pretty low. So we actually did consider it in you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, when we were doing things like quantitative easing uh, and forward guidance, and short-term rates were say, essentially at zero. We sort of asked ourselves, would it be a good idea to move to negative interest rates? And we decided against it because we thought that uh, the benefits wouldn't be that great. You can only go so negative before people actually start hoarding currency. And they say, I don't want to pay you to save, and so I'll just actually hold dollars instead. Uh, we also thought it would put the money market uh, business in the United States out of business. There would be no more U.S. money markets. And we thought that was probably you know, a cost uh, that we didn't necessarily want to pay. We also thought it was hard to tell a story about how, hey, we're going to generate an economic recovery. Uh, if you save, you have to pay us. Um, it's hard to tell a negative interest rate story that, that sounds reassuring. You know, my own personal view is that when you implement a, a policy, a monetary policy, you want people to say, yeah, that makes me feel better about what's going to happen, not feel worse. Uh, and finally, uh, people feel that the negative interest rate policy isn't necessarily good for the health of the banking system because it puts pressure on banks' uh, interest margins, and that makes them more reluctant to go out and lend. So I think you know this is an experience where the people that have negative interest rates, like Japan and Europe, uh, Switzerland has it for a whole different set of reasons. They're just trying to keep their currency from appreciating. I think our they're sort of stuck with it. I don't think they feel it's a wildly successful uh, set of policies. And I think in the U.S., because we have a much more deep and liquid money market, and we've seen their experience, I think the bar is, is very, very high to move. Everything else would have to fail uh, to, before we move, the Fed moved to that as a, as a, as a, as a tool. Next question, what's your opinion on the restrictions placed on the Fed's emergency lending authority after 2008? So what, after, what happened after 2008 was uh, the Fed had this authority called Section 13.3. And Section 13.3 basically said, if, it's, uh, if you define conditions in financial markets as unusual and exigent, that's the language, and you determine that there's no other source of credit to the people that you're wanting to use this for, the Federal Reserve can set up a facility to lend to them. This can be a group of firms, so you can have a facility set up for investment banks. This can be for an individual firm, so you can set up a, a structured investment vehicle just for AIG or for Bear Stearns. And uh, this was pretty controversial. And so in the Dodd-Frank Act, they basically took away the authority for the Fed to actually lend to a single individual entity. And they also said, if you're going to lend to any entity, you know, even a group of entities, you have to make it a determination that they're solvent. So the Fed doesn't have the ability to do Bear Stearns. The Fed doesn't have the ability to do uh, AIG. Uh, and you know, my personal opinion is you never know what's going to happen in the middle of a financial crisis. I personally would want to have more tools rather than less tools uh, when I actually get into that situation again. So I think, I think the wrong lesson was learned uh, from, the, from the crisis. You know, the lesson that should have been learned is that systemically important financial firms need to be well regulated and supervised and, and with a focus on their safety and soundness. What happened going into the financial crisis, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, AIG's Financial Products Group, uh, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, they were not regulated from a safety and soundness perspective. The Securities Exchange Commission didn't even think about that. Their model was if a securities firm fails, they go into bankruptcy, we protect all the customers of the securities firm through the SIPC fund, and life goes on. What we found is that bankruptcies for large, complex securities firms are catastrophic. So I personally think that having a 13-3 authority with a high bar to implement it, you know, you're not going to find situations as unusual and exigent very often. 
and you're not going to find that, uh, they, they, that people can't get credit from any other source very often, I think it's a, it's a useful tool to have in your toolkit. In fact, I would argue that they should actually go even further. I think that the Fed should have the ability to lend to any entity that's systemic as long as that systemic financial entity is subject to prudential regulation, including liquidity and capital requirements. That's the quid pro quo. You basically have to do these things to make yourself safer, and in exchange for you making yourself safer, we will provide a lender of last resort uh, in extremis. Having a broad lender of last resort authority is hugely important because if you have a lender of last resort that's truly viewed as backstopping the entire system, people won't run at all as frequently because, they, because they know that at the end of the day, if they need to get their money back, there's always the lender of last resort to take them out of their investment. The thing that we saw in the financial crisis, which was so remarkable, is people were not willing to lend to entities that they knew were solvent because they were worried that those solvent entities might not be able to pay them back because who could those entities borrow from? I mean, GE Capital in the fall of 2008 was a triple A rated company and they were having trouble issuing commercial paper, not I don't think because people thought GE was insolvent, but because they were wondering, well, gee, if, if I buy, buy this commercial paper from GE and other people are reluctant to buy it, how do I get my money back? Having a lender of last resort that backstops the system doesn't even have to be used very much. You know, it doesn't really have to be a lot of money actually going through that lender of last resort, just that it's there to reassure people that there's some way that they can be taken out uh, of their investment. The next question takes us to China. How do you view the risk stemming from a financial or banking crisis in China? Could the contagion spread to the U.S.? Well, you know, it's hard to assess the risks of a financial crisis in China because it's just such a very different regime than we have where the major banks are owned by the government. So when you're really talking about a financial crisis in China, I think at the end of the day, you're really talking about the fiscal capacity uh, of the Chinese government. And so far, at least, uh, it looks like they have sufficient fiscal capacity. You know, I think if something really bad were to happen in China, it would be really more about people in China deciding that they want to move their money offshore. And that started to happen a few years ago but the Chinese really cracked down and they sort of plugged all the, all the, all the leaks. Uh, so I, I think that you know, they have the fiscal capacity to deal with, with, with financial uh, issues uh, in China. Now, it's not to say that they don't have, have potential problems. Uh, there's been an extremely rapid uh, creation of, of private sector debt in China in recent years. Um, and so the corporate sector is probably overloaded on debt. But a lot of the corporate sector that we're talking about are state-owned enterprises. So again, it all sort of comes back to the Chinese government. So this is a potential problem, but it's not something that sort of keeps me up awake at, at night. You know, I think this is something that's maybe, maybe you know, a ways down, down the road. People have been talking about a blow up in China for maybe 10 years now. And you know, every time that we get close to start, starting to worry about it, the Chinese do more and, uh, and seem to be able to address their problems. It helps to be, have you know, you know, a very high level of control over your economy. The problem with having a high level of control over your economy, though, is you probably don't allocate capital very efficiently. Uh, and so as a consequence of that, you probably are ultimately going to have problems uh, having strong productivity growth over the medium term. You know, China has basically been in a, in, a, in a wonderful place where they're basically assimilating technologies from all over the world. And that allows them to grow very rapidly as they're catching up but once they've caught up, and I think they you know, are very close to having caught up, it's going to get a lot harder for them because their growth is then going to be predicated on what they can discover and what their innovations are. Uh, and so we'll see how well their innovation works. They're throwing a lot of money at it, but it's a command co and control economy, and it's not clear that a command and control economy can generate you know, high payoffs uh, from those sorts of investments. You got some more? So do you think continuing to ease monetary policy now 
removes the bullets in, ch in the chamber for the next recession. So this is the old debate, should you save your, if you only have a limited amount of powder, do you save your powder or do you use your powder? My personal opinion is that you probably want to use your powder because if you wait, you're going to need to do more. And if you have to do more, well, then the, then the issue that you have enough powder is going to become even more uh, acute. So I personally think that if you are worried that you don't have enough, a lot of ammunition, that the federal funds rate's not that high above zero, uh, that the tools to do quantitative easing again are somewhat limited because bond yields are already very low, uh, then I think it, that argues in the sense of going relatively early. And that's especially easy to do in the current environment where inflation is actually a little bit below uh, the Fed's uh, objective. If inflation was above the Fed's objective right now, so let's say inflation was 2.5%, we'd be having a completely different conversation. The Fed would be like you know, rubbing their you know, hands really intensely, wondering, do I pay attention to inflation or do I pay attention to the risks of growth? Right now, they don't have that tension because inflation is below their objective, not above their objective, so they can very much just focus on the growth side uh, of the equation. Why haven't we seen more inflation? Beats me. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, I think we've been surprised by that. I mean, I think everybody's been surprised by that. Um, you know, there's sort of two, there's a couple of competing explanations. explanations. One is uh, people say, well, it's Amazon vacation of the US economy. Amazon is just creating so much pr uh, pressure on other retailers that it's compressing profit margins and forcing companies to become more efficient and that's really put, putting downward pressure on inflation. You know, I think there's a little something to that argument, but I think it's hard to take that argument too far because we don't really observe particularly strong productivity growth in the economy right now. And we don't observe compressed profit margins. Profit margins are actually relatively high relative to what they've been historically. So. I think you know this, where I would put the uh, explanation is more that uh, number one, the, the the country is older and the workforce is older, and when the workforce is older, you can go to a lower unemployment rate without inflation because you don't have to, as many people that you have to absorb into your into your workforce. You know, you think about the 1960s where many 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 women were entering the workforce. You know, then you have to create a lot of jobs to absorb that labor, and I think that makes you more inflation prone in that particular environment. Second reason why we're not having an inflation problem is that I think that inflation expectations are extraordinarily well anchored. You know, inflation, you know, economists basically think inflation is driven by two things, pressure on resources and inflation expectations. But economists have, I think, very little insight in terms of how important is one versus the other. And I think we're finding out that the inflation expectations are really, really important in driving actual inflation outcomes. Now, I won't want to say that we want to throw out pressure on resources altogether, because if you basically think that doesn't matter at all, then why not have a 1% unemployment rate? You know, I don't think you want to throw out pressure on resources uh, completely as well, because what's your model of inflation then? Inflation depends on inflation expectations. But what does inflation expectations depend on? Then you have a model that's really totally unanchored, and you can't really explain inflation at all. So my personal view is, uh, the labor market, you know, we can, you know, the full employment rate is lower than we thought. Uh, the so-called Phillips curve, the relationship between tightness in the labor market and inflation is flatter than we thought. And, uh, you know, but if you drive the economy to a tight enough level, eventually you'll get some inf inflation pressure. I was on a panel with uh, Raghuram Rajan. Uh, Raghuram uh, is, uh, was the head of the Reserve Bank of India, and he's a very well-known academic economist. And it was funny, I gave my talk and then he gave his talk and we both talked about the fact that there actually is a risk a year or two from now that we actually will actually see higher inflation. And I felt somewhat reassured by that because Raghuram, uh, uh, he was the person that was most prescient about all the pressures building up before the financial crisis. So, so I, I feel like I have a, a good person on my side. Next question, with an aging population as we age and spend less, and with millennial generations saddled with student debt, what will drive spending, or may this drive the U.S. to the next recession? Well, so far, I mean, you're right that the fact that we have a more skewed income distribution is not good for uh, consumption because 
people who are billionaires, you know, if they get another billion, they're probably not going to go out and spend a lot more money. Um, and it's true that uh, student loan debt is inhibiting uh, that generation uh, from buying homes. Uh, and, 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 and because they have to first pay off their, their student debt. But if you look at, so I think those things are very true if you look at sort of the secular trends. But if you look at what's actually happening cyclically in terms of where are we right now in this business cycle, households are doing quite well. The consumer side is the strongest part of the U.S. economy, and that's really on the fact that we have job creation, we have rising wages, and we have, except for the millennials and the student loan debt, we have a pretty good balance sheet for the rest of, of U.S. households. But the question does get at something that you could do to make consumption even stronger. You know, if you had a tax code that was more, that distributed more money from the high end to the low end, uh, that would help. And the good thing also that's helping support consumption is that lower wage workers are actually starting to do better. You know, if you look at where the wage gains are really concentrated right now, it's really for less educated workers because the labor market really is tight. And so that actually also helps support consumption because there's a lot of people in the United States that basically don't save at all. They're just, you know, they're just paycheck to paycheck. And so if their paycheck's a little bigger, that goes directly uh, into consumer spending. You got some more for me? For me? Do you think the Fed has entered an ample reserve regime for good? How do you think the ample reserve regime compares to the scarce reserve regime? So let me explain the two regimes. So in the olden days, so this is prior to the fall of 2008, the Federal Reserve was not allowed to pay interest on reserves. And so as a consequence to control monetary policy, the Fed had to put just the amount of reserves into the, the system that was equal to the demand for reserve that banks had to hold reserves against their deposits. And we're talking about 40 or $50 billion of reserve. That's it. That's uh, what you call a scarce reserve system. So every day, the Fed had to make adjustments to how many reserves were in the system to offset things like the amount of currency outstanding, the Treasury cash balance at the Fed. And so there are all these phone calls between Washington and New York to make sure that they added just the right, right, amount, of, right amount of reserves to the system. Subsequent to the fall of 2008, the Fed got the authority to pay interest on reserves. <clears throat> that meant the Fed could control interest rates by setting the interest rate it paid on reserves, and that meant it could have a much bigger balance sheet. This was hugely important uh, to in, in, in the fight against the, 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 re the recession following the financial crisis because it meant the Fed could go unlimited. It could offer facilities of any size. It didn't have to worry that if we add a lot of reserves to the system, it's going to cause the federal funds rate to collapse. I'm going to lose control of monetary policy. I love the current regime. <laughs> I was the person running the open market desk during the old regime. I was the person that went to the FOMC meeting in the fall of 2008 and heard from the governors and the other FOMC participants, Bill, the, F the federal funds rate's not trading where it's supposed to be trading because we'd added so many reserves in response to the financial crisis that we had trouble getting the federal funds rate up to our target. No such trouble with having the ability to pay interest on reserves. You set the rate, you make sure there's enough reserves in the system, and then you're done. And the ability to follow the current regime, the current system, also allows that you could have unlimited backstops from day one. When we were going through 2007 and the first half of 2008, any liquidity facility that we were proposing always was of finite size because we were worried that if people drew down the facility, that was going to add reserves to the banking system that we're going to have to turn around and, and drain to keep the reserves in the banking system from growing too rapidly and putting downward pressure on short-term rates. Much better to have uh, the ability to offer big, open-ended uh, backstop facilities because then it, everyone knows that at the end of the day, there'll be enough money. If you tell them that your facility is $10 billion, they're going to say, well, that's really great if I'm the f one of the first $10 billion of people that come to your facility. But what happens if I'm the 10 billionth and $1? Uh, so I think the current regime is a much better regime, not just from a point of view of ease of, of, of use, uh, but also because it actually, I think, uh, helps you on a financial stability front uh, by allowing you to have these backstops that are broad and deep. Uh, so I think it's good for two distinct reasons. Not everybody agrees with me. There are people on the FOMC that want to go back to the old regime. 
a uh, number of years ago, and it's in the FOMC's transcripts. Uh, Chair, Chairman Bernanke actually had me debate Charlie Plosser, and the debate was about why we shouldn't commit today to go back to the old regime. And my job, and I demand, and I was, I was the advocate. I was, I told Ch uh, Chairman Bernanke that you got to let me argue for keeping the choice open between going back to the old regime and the new regime. I said, let's at least get some experience with the new regime before we decide we're not going to use it. And so I basically argued vociferously that we got to keep our options open. Maybe we'll like the new regime, and if we like the new regime, maybe we won't want to go back to the old regime. Well, we had the debate. Uh, Chairman Bernanke did a little straw poll around the table. Uh, the A's for Dudley beat the A's for Plosser, and we kept the issue open, uh, and that's what allowed us to sort of continue to go down this path uh, and follow the regime that we're in today. So you can see it for many, many years. Uh, I've been an advocate of this of this regime. So here's one that's more market driven. Any recommendations for what an aggressive long-term investor should invest in right now? That sounds like an oxymoron. Aggressive long-term investor. <laughs> I mean, if you're a long-term investor, my view is, you know, I have some friends that, you know, are in different occupations, psychologists, journalists, things like that, and they say, what should I do in terms of investing? I say, look, you want a broad portfolio, you want to basically put it away, and you want to see what it's worth 30 years from now. You know, this is not something that you want to manage on a high-frequency basis. You know, people have done studies of this, and they find that basically people who actively trade their portfolio do the exactly wrong thing on average. When the market's going up, they buy at the top, and when the market's going down, they sell at the bottom. You know, if you look at, the, for example, the tech bubble in 2000, take a look at what the NASDAQ did in the last three or four months. It basically went hyperbolic in the upward direction before crashing. So it's, it's really important, I think, if you're a long-term investor to not try to time the market. You know, when I look at the market right now, I basically feel like stocks are probably pretty fairly valued relative to the bond market. You know, the price-earnings ratio is high on a historical basis, but if you flip the P-E ratio and, and look at the E to P ratio, it's about 6%. Uh, that's pretty high relative to a 10-year Treasury bond that's yielding about 1.7%. So stocks don't seem rich. They seem rich a little bit, absolutely, but they don't seem rich relative to the bond market. The area that I feel most uncomfortable with is the 10-year Treasury, uh, you, know, you know, the long-term you know, bond area. And I feel uncomfortable with it because if you'd asked me five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, could we be at a 3.5% unemployment rate, close to 2% inflation, and we'd have a 10-year Treasury yield of 10% at a time that the budget deficit's exploding, I would say, no, those things are mutually exclusive. Probability equals zero. So I think it's really the bond market that I, that I, that I would be uh, a bit uh, wary uh, about. But of course, if bond yields go up, uh, that will spill over into the valuation of other asset classes. Uh, so you know, it's not like you'll you'll be uh, spared. The other thing I would be a little bit worried about is the corporate debt market. Not right now, because I'm optimistic that you know, relatively optimistic that we're not going to go into recession. But if we do go into recession, the corporate debt market in the U.S. is going to have serious indigestion. And the reason for that is corporations have decided to own more lower rated, issue more lower rated corporate debt. So years ago, there were triple A rated companies, double A rated companies, single A rated companies, and triple B rated companies. A lot of the triple A, double A, and single A companies have migrated down and decided to have triple B debt outstanding. And they've done that because they can use the proceeds to buy back shares, and that will actually lift their share price. So the, so the, so the lift to the share price is worth it. Now that's great for them today, but if everybody is collected in the triple B area and we have the next economic downturn, a lot of that triple B debt is going to be double B and single B debt, so it's going to be junk debt. And the number of people in, who can invest in high yield debt is much smaller than the universe of people that can invest in investment grade debt, so there's going to be a lot of indigestion in the market. You know, rates will go up just because uh, you're in recession. But there's also going to be going to go up because there's going to be a lot of forced sellers that just have to get out of their portfolios of now what is high yield debt. The recent changes in the tax code make this actually worse uh, 
used to be when you paid the government, federal government taxes in good times, and then you had a recession, you could go back to them and get a refund for the taxes that you paid now that you're losing money. The, the changes that we saw in the, in the corporate tax law took that away. Now, if you paid money in year one and are losing money in year two, no refund from the federal government. Also, the changes in the corporate tax law put limits on the deductibility of interest tied to your earnings. So if your earnings are coming down and your interest expense is the same, you're going to actually at some point lose the ability to deduct interest on your taxes. So that's also going to increase the squeeze on corporate America. So it's not something that's going to cause a recession, but something it's, it's, it's an area of the market that I wouldn't want to be in in the next recession. Okay, thank you. Very thank much. you.